Hello and welcome to the Step Change in Safety Working in the New Normal webinar. We are delighted to welcome so many of you from all around the world today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be part of this. Uh, I'm Kirsten Gove, I'm one of the Step Change in Safety support team. And uh, before I hand you over to our panel chair, Steve Ray, I just want to run through the webinar control panel, which is in front of you, and just make sure that you really get the most from this experience. Um, firstly, can I say, if you have any technical issues, whether it be vision or audio during the webinar, just click on the chat drop down menu, uh, type in your issue, press send, myself or my colleague Roy here, uh, we're in the background and uh, we're here to help you. Um, just as importantly, if you want to ask a question, and I hope you do, click on questions on the control panel. Simply type in your question and then press send. Uh, the question will come straight to us as organisers and you can do this throughout the webinar. We'll field the questions. So um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you again for joining us. I'm going to hand you over now to Steve Ray, the Executive Director of Step Change and Safety and all our panellists. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us, and I know they are dialing from near and far. So uh, a bit of a context of why we're doing this, our industry and its associated living and working spaces has evolved over 50 years, and through those 50 years we've seen change from technical side, from process side, and also from the safety side. I believe that the COVID-19 intervention that uh, went on this year will be one of those fundamental changes in our industry that will live with us for a while. So we felt this this uh, COVID-19 response was extremely important. And for a significant proportion of the workforce who were stood down in March as a result of the lockdown and to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19, the prospect of returning to work is probably quite daunting. So this webinar is intended to share experiences from a cross section of offshore workers and onshore workers who have remained at work during the lockdown period. We refer to that period as the new normal. This webinar is intended to provide an insight and to, from those folks on our panel who I'll introduce in a moment as to what they've seen change and what you can expect to see when you eventually return to your workplace offshore. So let me introduce the panel. We have Adele Bassett, who is the permit coordinator uh, on an onshore gas plant. She is an SI971 elected safety rep and also a member of Step Change and Safety's elected safety rep network. Kirsten Mackay is an HSE, HSE advisor and a RGN medic offshore. Kirsten. No. Uh, Ian Stewart is an OIM in an offshore installation. Hi there. Uh, Bob Egan is our HSE Workforce Engagement Specialist and is representing our regulatory uh, members of the Step Change Safety Leadership Team. Hello. And lastly, on our uh, panel, we have Stephanie Sunley, who is an offshore logistics supervisor. Steph is also an SI971 elected safety rep and a member of the Step Change and Safety elected safety rep network. So this website coincides with the launch of a series of new information films describing how operations have changed due to COVID-19 at your workplace. These short films feature some of our panelists from today who kindly film themselves at their place of work to share firsthand their insights on their new normal. We will be showing three of these films during the webinar with a full series being available via the Step Change and Safety website following the webinar. So let's begin with our first question. How are mustard drills managed with the upman? And this question uh, has been pre-populated from earlier questions submitted. I'll put that to the panel and I'll ask Kirsten, what, what changes has there been around the, the mustard drills? Well, I think mustard drills can pose a unique um, concern for personnel because the two meter social distancing is very difficult to attain at muster drills. So I'm aware there's different practice in different operators. So I don't want to give a one size fits all answer. I'm aware that people have been using the snoods 
um, to muster for that extra level of protection when you, you may not have the space to muster safely within a, a two meter social distance. Um, I know a lot of operators have been doing to the boat drills to maintain their safety case. Um, and that means that people put on their snoods and go to boats so that they have the added ventilation from external environments so that they're not at such high risk of, of droplet transmission. So um, I think I think there's definitely a lot of pre-planning that needs to go around uh, doing your muster drills and a lot of risk assessment for each operator. Thank you, Kirsten. Ian, I'd love to put that question to you as well as an OIM. Where, where do you see the most important changes around mustering? Yeah, I think uh, just backing up what Kirsten had said. Um, so we, you know, I think most people are very familiar with muster drills offshore, but in the, the new circumstances we have, there's far more attention needing to be paid to personnel having space at muster points, you know, and about there's a certain amount of individual um, culpability there to make sure you maintain your social distance. Uh, but we also uh, have extended muster areas. And as Kirsten had mentioned, you know, there's also the option of doing external uh, muster drills to minimize uh, transfer in the external environment. So I think drills are quite different from the the, the the, the mustering element of the drill and we also then try to keep and maintain that distance from the individual checks into the muster point um, until the muster is complete. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we'll move on to the, to the second question because uh, we've got many questions to get through today. Uh, this one I'll put to uh, Steph. Steph, what additional checks are carried out to monitor health and possible to detection of systems offshore on arrival? Um, if this is with regards to mobilisations, um, with core crew, what we're doing is um, we're pre-screening 72 hours before and we're using a, a pre-formed um, checklist and we go through um, all the serious illnesses that, that put people at higher risk. We ask if people are in fits, um, you know, they, they're feeling well, they've not got a cough, temperature, a loss of taste or a sense of smell. Um, we ask if they've travelled within the last 14 days and that gets done under a risk assessment if they have and um, because we do have people who, who live abroad. Um, with regards to vendors, there's a more robust checklist, um, part A and part B. Part A is filled in by the, the, the vendor themselves and they will fill in what asset they've been to, um, what the, the conditions were like on the asset um, and if there was any cases or, or known um, outbreak. Um, and then we, we take that information and the OIM, we, we don't mobilise anyone until the OIM and the, the other teams have approved that they're happy with where that person's been. Um, it also, if they're going to the NUIs, it gets um, briefed to the actual team that's on the NUI, make sure they're happy with, with the, the kind of um, controls in place. And then we then pre-screen them 72 hours before and make sure that they themselves feel in fit health as well. So there's, there's quite a robust um, process now and it, it does involve a lot more um, checks. So I'm, I'm quite happy that anyone that mobilises is free of symptoms. And if anything changes within that, that time frame before they're checking, they're, they're told to call us and let us know. Then from that, they get temperature checked at the heliport as well. So there's, there's loads of different barriers so that you know when they mobilise that, you know, 98%, you can feel confident that they're safe and they're, they're free of symptoms. Thank you, Steph. Comprehensive answer. Adele, what? Uh, if anything, are you doing differently on onshore plants around people arriving for work and while at work from a testing so, point of view? Okay, thank you. So recently we've introduced our temperature screening. Um, a lot of the people live locally, so we don't really do much pre-mobilising in the sense of 72 hours like we do offshore. But for our onshore asset, we are doing temperature screening as we enter in the site. Um, every time anybody enters the site, if they go out for dinner and come back, everyone's having temperature screening daily basically um, from a seven till seven point of view on our night shifts are also getting it at security as well. Thank you. On an ongoing basis, Kirsten, uh, from a medic's point of view, are you doing any additional checks through the through the uh, through the period of a rotation offshore for your workforce? Um I think as far as additional checks, we're not doing temperature screening. Personally, me and our team, we're not doing temperature screening when they arrive on the platform. They've gone through this gatekeeping process in advance. Um, what we are doing is making sure that people understand about infection control. Um, we're really 
for want of a better term, ramming the point home every day and making sure that hand hygiene is, is paramount. Um, because let's face it, it's a human barrier in this bow tie. That's all we've got. You know, we need people to use hand sanitizer. We need them to be aware of the process if they become symptomatic. Uh, if they do, obviously, we immediately implement our COVID plan. And that means individually isolating that individual, removing them from the general population. And then we just implement our plan straight away. Um, as far as any sort of secondary checks above what's being done, we have to be mindful not to be intrusive as well and to uh, treat people who are on the platform um, with an over-the-top approach as well. We don't want to panic people and we don't want people to feel that they're entering an unsafe environment. We feel that we've made this as safe as we possibly can. And I think that's the message we want to reinforce. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. So let's uh, get to one that for me is would appear to be particularly challenging at times, and that's around how we social distance while working at our workplace, and specifically if you work in teams, how would we approach uh, maintaining a acceptable social social distance and isolation? And I'll put that question to Ian, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, uh, so, well, it's the same, all of these things in the offshore environment, we know it's, uh, we're, we're, it's a best endeavors approach. And uh, anyone that works in the offshore environment knows that it's actually quite a close environment physically as well as mentally. And, and, and uh, so there are areas where, you know, offices, uh, uh, mealtimes, all the various places where people may congregate, mess rooms, rec rooms, we've, it's, it's easier because you can more physically distance in those areas. Uh, by putting measures in place. But there are particular jobs, especially out on the plant, where people are maybe working quite close together. Uh, so you, there's a, there are a range of things because obviously protection uh, that you require to do the job takes precedence in, in respect of, of uh, ensuring your safety on the job. But we also have to look and see what other measures can we put in place which can, can maintain or maximize the separation that individuals have on the job. So it's probably two different things. One is in your off shift time and the other is in your on shift time. And both of them have solutions, but they're different solutions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Steph, as a permit uh, and a logistics person, how would you go about uh, ensuring that people are aware, remain aware of that while they're going about their planning, their work, and so on? Um, to be honest, I'm with regards to flying and stuff. Um, we're we're only flying every two weeks, so I don't have a great deal in in sort of managing the, the flights. But when it comes to crew change, um, we're sort of making sure there's a separation between um, check-in times. Um, we're stopping the passengers from passing on stairwells when oncomers and offgoers. Um, there's seats, every single sort of area is labelled with them um, social distancing so that you, you're keeping that gap. Um, I mean, with regards to the, the platform as a whole, there's, there's social distancing everywhere in the galley and in the rec room and stuff. So we're just sort of being mindful. And if you do see someone that's maybe forgotten, because it is easy to forget, but um, we're just kind of making sure we remind everyone social distancing and stuff. But with regards to planning of work, I'm not I'm not so much involved with permit and planning of work. Um, I'm just involved with the, the logistical side of things. Okay, thank you. Let me move on to a question uh, that's came in from our, our, our attendees. This is from a, a Michael M Maloney. Uh, good afternoon. May I ask if there are measures which engineers and designers onshore can take that would help if they were specified uh, in ways in which would enable better isolation or spacing for workers offshore. Firstly, let me ask uh, Bob from an UK HSE point of view, are you focusing predominantly at offshore or will you be looking at the impact onshore from a, a work process offshore? Well, I mean, HSE, as people uh, may know, is split up into uh, various departments. So the offshore energy division will still be, still be looking at offshore, uh, but the FOD division will be looking at uh, onshore. There's a few crossovers with some of this, certainly with local authorities, what's under uh, their control uh, as well. Uh, we're, we'll still be inspecting, certainly the onshore inspections that I'm aware of uh, are, are, are far more uh, happening far more uh, now 
uh, on social distancing than, the, than they were. For offshore, we will be looking at social distancing as part of every offshore inspection. So whether that's a virtual inspection offshore or we'll probably be going offshore again very soon, uh, that will be part of every single inspection. So for engineers and planning things out and trying to see how you're going to uh, do we that on an asset? Well, yeah, we, we will be looking at that. Perfect. Good answer, Bob. And uh, thanks for being so, so detailed with it. I have another question from an Afshin Khan. And this, uh, I guess, is for you, Kirsten, uh, initially. If there are symptoms like cough or sore throat, is it advised to practice self-isolation in your cabin and call for the medic, or should you go and see the medic? That's a good question. Um, always go self-isolate. Uh, the idea is that if you're showing symptoms, you're viral shedding. So there are little, little, if you like, bits of virus falling off you and landing on the environment around you. And if you're coughing, you're producing droplets. The best move you can make is to take yourself out of circulation. And if you think about it, if you go and put yourself in a sick bay, you're contaminating all of that area and that's a, a hygienic area. Now, the next guy might come in with an infected toenail but he's just been exposed to that virus and you've exposed the medic as well. So if you self-isolate, I can put my PPE on and I can come and see you in your environment. It's contaminated already and then we've contained it. So good question and it's all about containment and that's what I do and I know that that's what everyone else is doing in the industry at the moment. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take one more question before we show the first of our short video clips. And uh, this question is, uh, it, I've, I've, let's say, I've reshaped it for something that came in from a, a, a question on online. Are, do you feel that you are prepared to do an upmanning now in a, offshore and you have the necessary processes and uh, measures in place? And I guess I'll put that question to, to Ian initially. Yeah, so I suppose there's there's two sides to that question. Are we currently prepared? Well, we're preparing to upman, and that involves you know risk assessment to identify what the current risks are and how we can manage that continued segregation offshore with larger numbers on board. Uh, so for me, there's two sides to the question. One is about the upman and where that upman becomes uh, it's unachievable to maintain you know, two meter segregation, say for instance, on board because of numbers or space within different areas. So at the minute we're we're comfortable where we are and we're looking at a risk assessment for moving forward and what that means and what number that, that may take us to. Uh, but then the secondary part beyond that, to me there's, there's a secondary bit of when or if, uh, what circumstances will allow us to start to think about reducing the social distancing offshore and starting to lessen the measures, which will then again have an impact on, on how we can do our work and keep people safe and healthy. Thank you, Ian. Adele, I'll put that question to you as well from an onshore facility perspective on uh, let's increasing manning or, or looking at doing turnarounds and so on. Okay, so our manning at the moment is um, is set via our planning, so our safety critical and business critical maintenance. Um, if it's not business or safety critical, and we don't need the men there, they're following the government guidelines and they're staying at home. People can work from home, that's where they're probably going to stay for a while. Um, as for upmanning, we've been discussing um, back-to-work introductions, obviously a little bit similar to when you um, come back on your rigs offshore. Um, a lot of people may have not been at work for 12 weeks, um, 10 to 12 weeks, and we want to make sure that they're aware of the new changes, the new normal, as we're calling it. Um, and to make sure they're aware of the, the existing hazards, whether it's been on a coma site with our major accident hazards. So we're trying to refocus on our major accident hazards, but ensuring that the new normal becomes their everyday talk and their walk, basically. Great. Thank you, Adele. So uh, let's move to our first short video. Uh, and this video uh, was prepared by Kirsten Mackay and examines the new normal life from a health and safety perspective. Okay, and if I can just remind all panellists to mute your microphones, please. Thank you.
My name is Kirsten Mackay. I'm a medic health and safety advisor and I work offshore. So I've been asked to describe what the new normal is like from a health and safety and a medic perspective. And I don't know if anything really feels very normal for anyone right now. But what I can do is describe what we do from the medic perspective. A lot of things that will be worrying you right now are how we stem the spread of COVID-19 in an offshore environment. And that's very reliant upon hygiene measures. So in order to control and stop the spread, you might have noticed that manning levels have been reduced. On some platforms, this might start increasing now. COVID-19 is spread via droplets. So we know that in order to contain this virus, we need to up all hygiene measures so that means cleaning cupboards between day and night shift if they are cohabiting, so a shift about. For us, we are not having day sharing cabins, so uh, it enables cleaning in between individuals. We have implemented a contingency plan. This plan details where our isolation zones are, what cabin we will use for primary isolation of COVID-19 patients how we remove people from the platform who are symptomatic and get them to a place of safety and what's required hygiene measures afterwards and during. PPE is really important for us as frontline service providers, as the medic. So it's important we have adequate RPE and coveralls and uh, suits, disposable gloves, obviously, and aprons. So these are all put in place should someone be symptomatic. Now what we do is if a person is off shift and they become symptomatic, they have the information in the cabin as to the phone number of the control room or the email address of the control room. If they don't have a phone in their cabin, they can raise the CRO this way. The CRO will get us up and out during the night or within shift. And we will don our PPE and go and see that individual in their cabin. If you're on shift, we obviously don't want someone who's symptomatic to be walking around the platform and potentially viral shedding. So you would go to the COVID cabin, pick up the phone and dial the medic and the medic would see you there. These are different arrangements than what we're used to, obviously. From my health and safety um, hat now, what we know is that risk assessments have changed. Who knew? that we would be doing a risk assessment to discover if it was safe to stand next to someone at a T point. But here we are, this strange new reality we're living with. One of the things that you would have noticed is the snood. This is so you can sit on the helicopter and obviously you can't maintain your two meter social distancing when you're sitting next to your colleague flying out. So this enables you to have a barrier method, very much like wearing a mask when you're coming to and from work. One of the things that people are asking is when you're at your work site, how do you safely do your work if you can't keep social distancing? Well, one of the things I would say is that viral load is how you develop your symptoms. So the virus sheds and the more virus particles you take in, the more likely you are to develop the virus. If you're standing within a uh, a meter of a colleague or closer and you're working if you're in an exposed and open environment that means that there's a airflow and dilution if you like so you're less likely to get the same volume as if you were in the accommodation and you were standing next to someone who was viral shedding and perhaps shedding droplets towards you now that probably doesn't make you feel very secure anyway however one of the things that we are doing individually and as a company is looking at our work scopes and risk assessing. I never thought that we would have to look at pandemic when we were working out if we can change a valve, but that's where we're at. So for us, it's important to chunk a job, to move personnel around so that they're not working face to face in close quarters. It might mean canceling jobs and pushing back work scopes. It certainly has changed the territory of which we're used to working. I think one of the things we have to be mindful of 
is that we work in a major accident hazard environment and this is eclipsing our perception of risk. At the end of the day, the things that are so dangerous offshore are still so dangerous offshore. It's now got this confounding factor where we're actually working in pandemic spread as part of it. So I want you to still be mindful of your safe isolations, of transiting to and from work, of wearing your PPE correctly, of being aware of your process safety. All of the things that we are mindful of on day-to-day -day business, none of those hazards have changed. All those risks are still there. As a company, what we've done is we've tried to split day and night shift as much as we possibly can so that there isn't um, the congregation of people on day shift. So it makes it easier to maintain social distancing. And that's been a concerted effort and it's taken a lot of time and energy to successfully do that, but it's working. Knocking on wood, we've not had any reports or infections or positives in the last month. So everything crossed. Stay safe out there. Thank you. So that was one of, uh, one of the six videos that will be released following the webinar and uh, hopefully it's been thought provoking for you and may have uh, may have uh, sprung you into putting some questions in if, if you feel the need. So let's uh, move swiftly on to the next question, uh, which came from, a, let me just move this slightly, this came from an Alec Wilson, uh, and I'm going to expand it to be more than just diving operations, but Alec asks, what has been the impact to diving operations on scheduled inspections across our assets? I would expand that to say, what about scheduled maintenance and tars on our assets? Uh, I'm going to go to two people here. I'm going to go to Bob Egan first from an HSE perspective on a compliance and regulatory compliance, and then I'll come to Ian from an OIM's perspective. Bob. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the regulatory uh, compliance issues, none of that has changed. You know, uh, all the same rules still apply. Uh, if anything, we've got extra rules uh, and extra processes in, in place now. So just, I mean, you, you would take any form of activity to have a greater focus, a more concentrated focus, but all the rules, all the regulations, uh, all the expectations are in safety uh, in place uh, to keep people and processes and plants safe. So none of that, none of that has changed. Thank you, Ian. From a planning point of view and an uh, integrity point of view, what does it look like from an OEM's viewpoint? Yeah, well, so I mean, one of the things we discussed initially when when the the situation occurred and we were down manning the platform is what what the core team would look like to to manage the asset going uh, going through the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic restrictions, uh, and we set the the, the the numbering and the work scope and the work plan around uh, business critical, safety critical maintenance. So we maintain the safety critical maintenance requirements and we maintain the business critical maintenance requirements. And again, as uh, some of the other team have talked about, you know, that means that risk assessments are reviewed, you know, not only about the work scopes that are performing, but about other uh, changes in relation to COVID-19 and other uh, exposure for individuals. So, you know, from our perspective, uh, we we have carried on with our safety critical maintenance. And just as Bob mentioned, you know, just because of, of COVID-19, that hasn't changed the major accident hazards in respect of the offshore asset. And that will be the same for, for uh, coma sites onshore, I'm, I'm sure, as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both Ian and Bob, for your responses there. So, uh, There's a question for uh, some of the panellists. I'll go to Adele first for this one. Adele, what has been the biggest change at your workplace with respect to the measures introduced as a result of COVID-19? So there's been several um, things put in place since the start of this. Um, again, with the rest of the panellists, we've all been here from the start. Um, from walking in the gates, really, there's markings on the floor, your signage everywhere. Um, you've got that chronic unease of being too close to people, as you probably do when you go to the supermarket. Um, not much is really different in that sense that you you have the same behaviours as you would if you're walking the streets, really, and going to the supermarkets and shops. Um, 
things from my point of view in my role as a, a permit to work coordinator and issuing permits um like um steph touched on earlier we've staggered our start times so um people are coming in at different times it means the toolbox talks in the mornings there's not as many people in the groups and the toolboxes so people can socially distance to an appropriate level and then when they come to get their permits as well it means that there's not as many people coming to your desk for permits so that can all be controlled quite well really um meetings any meetings that we're having we're all trying to do it via skype um and any that do have to be face to face so going to the work site for hazard identification walks out walkouts um, pre-task and post-task um, we're able to socially distance and do that to an acceptable limit so there's quite a few changes but in a sense it has been going on for a while now so I feel like it's, it's becoming the norm or the new norm as we like to call it <laughs> the new norm <laughs> thank you Adele Steph as a first person people are likely to see arriving in your asset what are the main concerns they immediately arise with you if they have any um I mean, once I, I'm quite confident in our robust kind of check procedures that when people arrive, I, I kind of feel like I'm confident to know they're safe. But it's really difficult that when they come on, you know, it's normally such a jovial atmosphere. You know, you're like, hello, how are you? Welcome back. And it's quite difficult to kind of remember that you shouldn't be close to them. You shouldn't be shaking their hands. And, you know, and, you know, I've been there so long. It's like everyone's like family. And it's 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 really difficult to try and remember that you're not supposed to get close to people. And sometimes you get so involved that you forget and you've got to remind yourself and remind other people around you. And um, with the OIM briefs, um, you know, most of it's COVID related now and, you know, about also the ongoing tasks. And it's kind of as soon as you come on, it's like, right, this is what's changed. This is what's happening. This is the new um, the new procedures and changes to any of the risk assessments and stuff. So it's it, it it is like Adele says, it's a new normal now. Um, in the beginning, it was it was completely different and and almost lonely. Um, but now you're kind of getting used to it again. And it, I think the longer it goes on, the more the more we will get used to it. But I think it's about complacency and making sure we don't kind of forget what we're supposed to be doing now. Thank you, thank you. Let's uh, let's take another question from uh, from our attendees online here. I have one from a Sandy Fettis. Uh, and I'm going to change this slightly uh, as I go along. It's how do you think duty holders are collaborating on best practice and data sharing and analysis to continually improve safety and our ability to maintain operations offshore? I'll suggest because we all have multiple assets. The people on the call just now. Are you? How are you sharing uh, information and best practice across your asset bases, individual companies, and uh, through your network as uh, as offshore workers? Uh, Ian, uh, are you, how are you going with that? I'll come to you next, Gustin. Ian? Yeah, so, I mean, it, we, we're using the protocols we have for information sharing within the business normally. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of transfer of information across our assets, and then there's also transfer of information within the industry. So I think the, the communication links are, are well set up. Uh, what we've done through the COVID-19 uh, situation is we've we've used existing communication methods and data transfer methods to to transfer some other information that maybe we wouldn't have normally transferred within the group and and to the to the wider industry so i think it's good you know the industry is an established industry and we have good communication links both internally within the company and and externally so um, it's just transfer of more information and different information is maybe the way to say it uh, Kirsten, you you have a, a comments to add to that? Yeah, just exactly as Ian said. I think um, OG UK. There's been a lot of external body influence on how we measure and manage the influx of information coming in each day. It's such a fluid situation with COVID-19, and uh, there's a lot of information that needs to be filtered, and not all of it is legitimate information. So, uh, I think. Yeah, we are very reliant as an industry upon um, upon our, if you like, our governing bodies, uh, our the people that set um, standards. And I think it's really important that we've done that crossover with the NHS, and we're reliant upon each other now for for information sharing. And I can see that strengthening as we go forward. Thank you, Kirsten. Bob, I know you have some comments that I'd please feel free to do so. Yeah, it's just, I mean, this is a worldwide pandemic and 
I'm well aware of regulators th from throughout the world do, are all sharing information on a, a regular basis, whether it's PSA, NOTSIMA, uh, uh, the Australian regulators, Brazilian regulators. Everybody's getting involved uh, uh, with industry regulators uh, throughout the world are sharing best practice and what they're learning uh, as well. So it's going on through all aspects of the industry and not just the operators. Thank you. We'll take one more question from the from the attendees before we move to the second short video. I have a question from a Stephen Forrester, and again, I'll add libit because it's what I'd like to do. Uh, we know there's going to be changes to some rotational uh, shift working patterns, and we also know that some folks are having to turn up a couple of days early for screening before they go offshore. What uh, What's the impact on those folks when they get offshore, and are we doing anything about uh, assessing fatigue in a different manner? And again, I'm going to put that to, uh, let's start with, with, with Ian uh, from an OEM's perspective. Yeah, so again, the, the new normal is 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 uh, in some ways very different than what we've we've looked at before. And I know uh, individual operators are doing different things rota wise. Uh, we we have adjusted the rota, and we've adjusted it, you know, primarily from a from a, a less exposure perspective, which did end up then with a longer offshore trip, uh, but a longer home trip as well. So we, we've kind of reduced the rotations in a year by 33%. Um, uh, what we did along with that was we did uh, do a review and we did a, a fatigue risk assessment and we updated our fatigue policy to take into account various factors that that introduces. You know, so you've reduced the the exposure risk by people travelling less, but on the other side of that, then you've extended an offshore trip. So how do you manage and make sure that the offshore trip you don't uh, add more risk from a, an extended working perspective? So we've gone through our whole overtime policy and how we work that, make sure we're minimising overtime, and it's becoming you know a very clearly defined authorization process for that. We've also talked about, uh, you know, we, we we reached out to people and helped them to try and understand how, you know, the team uh, is very important in making sure you're looking out for your colleagues as well through these difficult times and and uh, making sure that you're all there for each other. Uh, from a work planning perspective, you know, we've tried to reduce the work plan to cope with extended trips and potentially, you know, towards the end of those trips, people being affected. But we did, that's been formalized in that fatigue risk assessment and then we managed that with our fatigue policy. Great, thank you, Ian. So just before we move on to some further questions, let's uh, go to the second video uh, that we're going to play. And this is our, uh, let me see, this is Adele Bassett and our permit work coordinator onshore. Hi, my name is Adele Bassett and I'm a Permit to Work Coordinator at an onshore gas terminal and I'm also a Step Change in Safety Elected Safety Rep. In my role as a Permit to Work Coordinator, I issue permits on a daily basis. By staggering the shift start times, we reduce the manning at the permit window of the morning. We've also introduced barriers and signage and lines on the floor to ensure social distancing is adhered to when coming to collect the permits. Finally, we've installed perspect windows to ensure a distance between myself and the PAs at all times. We are planning less work due to reduced manning. We have increased our stores inventory to ensure we have enough tools, equipment and materials to carry out our business critical and safety critical work scopes. We've introduced staggered shift start times to ensure we can adhere to social distancing at morning toolbox talks and permit issues. If we identify a task that requires people to work in close proximity to one another, the first question we are asking is, does the task need to be done? If so, further controls are put in place, such as additional PPE and reducing the time spent in close proximity. 
These extra controls are added to a risk assessment. We've changed our methods of communication and reduced face-to-face -face contact to a minimum. Meetings are now being held virtually and face-to-face -face contact, everybody's adhering to two metres social distancing. In my role as a safety rep, over the past couple of months, management have involved us in any changes regarding COVID-19. This has included our site risk assessment, our back to work briefings, emergency response procedures and our industry gap analysis. We've also had the opportunity to be involved in something we wouldn't normally be exposed to, such as our introduction of temperature screening. Thanks to Adele for putting that video together uh, in, our, in our work time, uh, much appreciated. Uh, moving on with the questions, I have a question for uh, Bob Egan specifically uh, from uh, Agari Gerity, and it's around, has there been a change in the number of calls to the HSE during the last two to three months where they focused on COVID issues rather than other issues? Uh, with an HSE, there's a, a, a COVID helplines, not the right word, but there's there's people uh, set aside within HSE that are specifically uh, looking at COVID and social distancing issues. There has been a number of calls uh, on that. What I'm aware of now is these have tailed off a little bit, but they may with uh, people starting to go back to work and like up manning on sites or offshore. Uh, this could in increase again. I don't have the figures, unfortunately, uh, for that. There certainly was an increase at the beginning, then it's tailed off a bit, uh, and we'll, we'll see what's happened. But there's uh, people specifically looking at COVID and social distancing uh, within HSE. Thank you, Bob. Uh, question for uh, yourself, Steph. From a logistics point of view, how, how are the changes in planning of uh, room occupancy and so on and so forth offshore, uh, how has that changed, if it's changed at all? Um, so we used to be, um, we've got 174 beds and recently we actually dropped to around 100, 110 due to um, just sort of POB management. Um, with COVID, we actually went to everyone having a cabin on their own and we have um, four man cabin. So there's actually one person in a room with four beds at the moment, which gives us 43 POB. Um, so right now with cabin allocations, it's quite simple. Someone goes out, someone goes in. Um, and it has been very simple, but, but obviously, as you've mentioned, there, there are talks about manning. Um, so we can still have um, single occupancy with one person in one side of the, you know, with the two, the, the two men rooms within a cabin. So we can still maintain single occupancy um, and, and, and double the numbers almost. So for, for us, it really hasn't been too too difficult with allocations of cabins. It's, we've, we've reduced our crew changes. We used, to, we used to fly almost every day, bringing people on and off. Um, but we've actually changed to a two and four, which means we only fly um, every two weeks instead of um, every week, because we used to be two and three. So now you have people come on and then people go off and you're locked down for, for two weeks. and self-isolating if you like um sort of in your own little incubation period so it's it's changed quite drastically for us but for the better i think and it's been very very easy with regards to um, making sure everyone's safe and and happy thank you steph kirsten from a medical uh, practitioner standpoint and from a possibly a, a more a or a less uh, easy pob to manage what, what do you see happening differently from the management of uh, cabins and space and so on going offshore for occupancy? <laughs> well, hygiene measures are critical. Um, so they're really our barrier. Uh, so for us, we're, I can only speak for, for our organisation, but we don't do day sharing cabins and we're trying to hold off on that until um, the uh, COVID response across all of the UK is it a place where it's safe to do so? So for us, we we clean in between shifts, and that means that the bathroom, the toilets, and all flat surfaces in that cabin 
are disinfected completely. Um, and it's it's difficult to do. You need to have the stewards to do it. So it means you have to upman um, your frontline support. So this is where we realize how important these people are to us offshore. They are our lifeblood. They service our food, they clean our cabins, they make sure we are we're given sustenance and our environment is clean and safe. And they're also my first aiders. So I, I hold them to a very high standard. I think they're uh, exceptional people. So I think it's important that we, we pause and recognize what they do to keep us safe because they are the barrier against COVID uh, in 99% of the time. So we've got them coming into our cabins in the morning and doing an amazing job. Uh, so we're preventing our night shift from going into the cabin until the cabins are cleaned. So we've had to upman stewards so that we're not keeping people back from going to their beds. So we've got an hour period between shift changeover and we're trying to stagger our shifts so that there's very little impact on our night shift boys or girls going to their beds. Um, and to reflect what Ian said, you know, when you're looking at preventing fatigue and when you're looking at how you're going to upman or manage the, the man hours you've got, the effort that is going into that offshore right now, it's phenomenal. Uh, there's, it's, there's so many moving parts that have to be managed to maintain that barrier. So, yeah, it's critical. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, a question for yourself. Uh, it just came in from a, another question from Alec Wilson. Uh, what is the general emotional feel on the asset and with regards to the working environment? Have you have you sensed a noticeable change in the in the camaraderie or the morale of the folks offshore? Uh, I think people that work in the offshore environment understand that it's it's kind of more than an onshore work relationship that we have with all our colleagues offshore. So. You know, we, we, we know each other very well. A lot of us count ourselves as friends as well as colleagues. And in circumstances like this, you know, you see the same in, in a mini form that you're seeing onshore. You know, you're seeing people digging digging down and uh, being being more caring about each other. Uh, they, you know, certainly the emotional or the, 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 the people's interaction physically is a lot less. But emotionally, everyone's trying to keep everyone else, uh, uh, let's say, in a healthy mind spot as well. Um, I think it's it's been very important to see how much uh, people placed in this circumstance in the offshore environment. Certainly, when we started uh, with the, the the strict restrictions, I think people coming offshore were concerned about coming offshore. But I think as people have come, you know, as the team has mobilised throughout the the period that we've had, uh, now we're at the point where I think people feel safe in the offshore environment because they understand the amount of controls that we have in place, which you know most of the panelists have discussed during various questions. But from a mental perspective, I think people are are, are you know we're proving our mental resilience. Uh, people. It is a little bit of a double whammy out here because not only are you are you away from home and away from friends and family who may you perceive be at risk, but also you're not then interacting in the same normal emotional way that you would with your what tend to be close friends in the offshore environment. So it has been a it has been difficult for everyone, but we are seeing people developing that in a different way now. That that uh, you know it's it's actually good to see how people have developed offshore as well as onshore in that respect. Thank you. I'm conscious of the time and I want to give every one of the panellists an opportunity to answer this question and we're not going to run to a third film because I'd rather take the questions. Uh, so we've made great inroads into managing the social distancing and all the other control of work aspects uh, in preparation for uh, starting to up man slightly. Individually, what is your biggest concern uh, as we go forward from the current manning levels to what I would call the new normal mining levels, where there'll be a bigger uh, POB. And let's start onshore as we typically do. Uh, Adele, is, have you raised any concerns around up mining for a tar or so on and so forth, or doing something different? And what's your concerns around that? Um, I haven't particularly thought about concerns personally, but there's been a few things mentioned over the past um, week or two with um, some of the workers worried about up mining, because at the moment we feel like we're at our capacity with it. Um, so we can maintain the social distancing, but if we up man, are we going to be able to maintain that to an appropriate level 
um because we, we seem to be doing a pretty good job at the moment um meeting rooms are quite restricted and things like that if we're if we're having to do face-to-face -face meetings i think on site we're, we're a little bit more um flexible with it obviously we've got probably a lot more space <laughs> than an offshore installation um yeah with with the work activities i think it's not that great of an issue but it's probably more in the building and, and in our offices um like i said the shift i think they may start looking at the shift times a little bit more as something we're going to keep going going forward um, we know with our with our operations guys who run the plant the uh, they used to start at seven o'clock and now they start at six or so half of the shift are coming in an hour earlier so they don't have that crossover between um all the people on the same shift as well and they're also isolating them sort of in the control room so the people who are running our plant are dedicated and they're away from everybody else so i think a lot of things will stay the same as for bringing new people in i think they're going to have to look at the people that they bring in and if it's necessary and again looking at the, the work plan to be planned if it's safety critical or business critical going forward um people may not be needed to come back as soon as we'd have hoped until we can get those measures in place thank you Kirsten from a medical practitioner's point of view what is what concerns does further up manning bring to your to your uh, to your door and your medics cabin it's kind of a, a curse and a blessing in a way, <laughs> so diplomatically. <laughs> but um, as Ian said, you know, um, people are quite muted at the moment, trying to navigate a way through the stress they have at home, the worry they have for their loved ones and those that are perhaps, you know, fragile. People potentially haven't seen their fragile family members for the last two months, you know. So they're coming offshore and uh, you can imagine the stress that brings. So at the moment, with reduced manning levels, um, it's been quite difficult for the leadership teams trying to maintain staffing when you get a phone call, you know, someone hasn't made it through screening at the heliport, you know, so your team's less. So you've got this middle middle strata of people trying to constantly patch this, um, this dam that's hemorrhaging people, you know, and it, it's a huge stress um, and there's a huge amount of pressure on these guys. And they're very resilient people and they're getting a lot of organizational support. So touch wood, things have been going really well. But you know, it's been a balancing act. So now with an upman, we have, you know, the added benefit, I suppose, of more personnel, less pressure on them. But then we've got to focus on what's the mental state of the people coming offshore. And we're finding these strange little camps where people arrive off the chopper and for the first seven days they're really maintaining this fantastic social distancing and we're walking down the corridor and giving them a wide berth because they haven't been here for seven days and then all of a sudden after seven days people start to bunch up and it's like two meter distance spring apart again so I think um, it's going to be challenging it's going to be challenging maintaining the two meter social distancing but at the same token if we do everything that we say we're doing and we enforce it in, you know, uh, equitable and not fascist sounding way, then we're going to be fine and we're going to look after the people offshore. But stress and pressure, we've got to be aware that there's more going on here in people's lives than just what they're presenting at work. So managers out there, pay attention. Thank you. Bob, from an inspection and a, and a regulator's point of view, what are the biggest concerns you have about going back offshore or, or you and your colleagues? Oh, maintenance levels, competence levels. There's a lot of very experienced, competent people that have been working offshore, can't go offshore because they're uh, in a protected group for, for other health reasons. They're, they're now removed from their chance to uh, go to the workplace. So how is that getting managed? How's that getting dealt with? Uh, for for HSE themselves, we've got vulnerable people working that uh, through health conditions may be going offshore. So there's a lot of changes within uh, HSE need to be in place. Uh, also, before we get we get offshore, we, 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 that's been the planning's been going on for that. But then it's getting the team make up what could be done virtually. But there's still nothing like getting offshore seeing people seeing the reality uh, uh, seeing, seeing the true true life examples so there is concerns with that like everybody there's concerns with heliports uh, heli travels uh, how is how is that in reality because we've not been offshore for a while 
uh, ourselves. So there's the personal things, but also the job, what's happening on the job. So uh, it's making sure all that's there. And as usual, competence and maintenance are uh, very high up there uh, for things getting checked. Thank you, Bob, Ian and uh, Steph. I have not got the time to let you answer that one uh, comprehensively, so I do apologise. Uh, what I would say to the people who are still putting questions in is your questions will remain with us and we'll do our best to get answers to you one way or another through our website. Uh, we've, Believe it or not, that's an hour we've been online and we're almost done. So it leaves me to bring this to a close and remind everyone that we will have six short video clips uh, that will give more information on what the new normal looks like on and offshore. Uh, and in a way of saying thank you, of course, I want to say thank you to all our panellists for, for being brave enough and taking the courage to sit on uh, sit on the panel and, and take these questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank the backroom staff in Roy Stewart and uh, Kirsten Gove and Gillian, System from, Gillian Simpson from Step Change and Safety for making this look seamless. Uh, of course, I want to thank everybody for dialing in and attending today. Uh, but most importantly, it was mentioned earlier on, let's take our hats off to the catering and hotel crews who are absolutely playing their part in keeping these cabins and recreational and uh, shared spaces sanitised and clean. So they are our frontline workers. We congratulate them on doing a fantastic job and we must always remember that uh, sometimes there are unsung heroes in every crisis so with that we thank you so much for your uh, for your attendance we look forward to uh, continuing our engagement with you and most of all we want you all to play your part and keep safe thank you thank you very much cheers cheers thanks <laughs>